Jeeps. Woo! It's the Great Depression. That doesn't sound fun. No, I don't mean how you felt during the pandemic or because you didn't get to graduate from high school in a fancy ceremony with balloons and hats. No, not that Great Depression. The Great Depression that happened in the 1930s in the United States history. Also, um, we're going to have some little family story on it. And I just want to preface this by um, um, this my story about the family story in this lecture. Years and years ago, my dad's mom died. She wasn't a terribly nice person to my mother or to me, um, but she was my dad's mom. And my sister was very upset because mom was in Alaska taking care of my sister who had back surgery. And she called me all sad because dad's mom had died and he was all alone. And I said, no worries. I'm the big sister. I will go to Montana and I will take care of dad. Uh, and so I did that. And then there was a funeral for his mother in Glasgow, Montana. And then we had to drive, not Glasgow, in Great Falls, Montana. Um, and then we had to drive all the way across the state to Glasgow to bury her. So I was in the back of my dad's car while he and his big brother were in the front seat uh, reminiscing about when they were young. And I thought, holy shit, this is stuff I lecture about. Um, and that's where this version of the lecture was born, was in the back seat of my dad's um, Bronco 2. I guess he used to have one. It's a cool car. Anyway, uh, when we get to that part, I do not expect you to take notes, and I will say that again. There is no universe where I expect you to take notes on my family or regurgitate that for a test. That would be that would be wrong and disgusting. Anyway, let's get on with the lecture. Yeah. All right. Uh, the Great Depression began in October of 1929 when the stock market crashed. Oh, no. The stock market crashed and thus began uh, a nationwide massive uh, depression. Indeed, the Great Depression. Um, um, and, and here's the thing. Uh, there's two things here. And the first is, it's called the Great Depression because not because it's the only depression America had. There's a great big economic depression in the 1830s. There's another one in the 1870s. There's another one in the 1890s. Um, it, it's called the Great Depression because it was big because America's population had expanded and, and also because it was the last really bad one we had. Indeed, when the economy collapsed in the wake of uh, the Republicans' Uh, mismanagement of the government and the banks uh, in 1990s with George Bush Jr. Um, that that economic uh, disaster, while it seemed bad to the people who lived through it, and you may have been very young during those years, it was nothing near that. And we called it the Great Recession. So a recession is like a, uh, the junior sibling of a depression. Um, and then here's the other thing about that. What does that mean, the stock market crash? So for a hundred years, uh, not a hundred years, but it seemed like in high school and grade school and middle school, every time you learned this stupid Great Depression, and it did seem stupid, um, they'd say the stock market began when the stock market, I mean the Great Depression began when the stock market crashed. And I never knew what that meant. Like I hear the words, I understand the words, but like most people I know don't own stocks, how could the stock market crashing crash the entire uh, national economy, how could it affect people too poor to own stocks, how did that work? Uh, but I could live with the fact that I didn't understand that because I just assumed the world was full of money matters I don't understand. Um, and, and two, because um, I didn't have to understand it and, and, and I wasn't a history PhD yet. And then when I was writing my um, dissertation, there's a, like I said, there was a depression in 1873 to 75 and I had to know how that worked for my dissertation for reasons you don't care one whit about. So I had to figure out how that worked. And then the other thing that helped me is in the Great Recession that happened uh, in, the, in the Bush years, the Bush presidency years, um, we were living through it, so it was easy to see how it happened. So anyway, here's what it is. I have a lot of slides. I'm not going to spend any a lot of time on any of them. So don't let, if you, uh, anyway, you haven't seen the number of slides. Let's go. So here's the thing. When the stock market falls, I love this sign. $100 will buy this car. I must have, must have cash lost all in the stock market. This guy's got to sell his hat. His hat. 
his car. He gets to keep his hat, at least for now. Anyway, um, one wonders if he sold his car. Who had $100? Um, anyway, when the stock market falls, here's the deal. People and companies have money invested in, this, in the stock market. Those are the two groups of entities that have money in the stock market, even today. Companies, people. Uh, uh, and, 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 and the kind of people that have money invested in the stock market are usually rich people. Um, yeah, there are some middle class people with some small investments, but rich people will have a lot of money, and some of them lost a lot of money, and, and indeed some of them didn't just sell their car, they killed themselves because they lost their entire fortunes and they couldn't face a world where they were just like the rest of us poor minions, right? Um, but uh, among the companies that had money in the stock market were banks. And the thing about banks is their money is your money. Like uh, my money isn't Chase Manhattan, um, and so Chase Manhattan has all this money, and some of it is mine. Uh, and it's not like if I go down there and withdraw $40, that they go back to the back room and there's like a shoebox there labeled Peg Lamphere and all my money's there. It's not there. They've got it invested. They take my money and they use it to make money. Then they charge me so to use their money, to use my money to make money for themselves. Banks have a system. It's so, if you ask me, corrupt, but nonetheless. So the banks, when the stock market crashes, banks lose their money. But they don't lose just their money. They lose customers' money. They lose Joe Smith's money and Peg Lamphere's money and et cetera, et cetera. Right? Okay. So there's that. Let's see what's next. So the first thing that happens is people hear the stock market has crashed and that banks have lost all their money. And people aren't stupid. They know the bank's money is really their money. So you get, um, in the Great Depression, the very first thing that happens is all the nation, all over the nation, there's a run on banks. And that means crowds show up at the banks and demand their money back. Um, but again, Banks don't have your money sitting in a back room in a, room in a shoebox. So maybe the first 20 or 30 people in the door, they get their money back because banks do have um, um, some cash on hand. But then everybody else, now the bank has lost, doesn't has run out of cash on hand, and all the invested money is gone. And it was never in the bank to start with, right, because it's invested. So you, a lot of people lost their their life savings as it were but the money they were going to use to pay the mortgage or to pay the bills on their butcher shop they regular human beings lost didn't lose their money the banks lost it for them let's not let's this is just like the great recession banks are the culprit here not people what happens next then is banks don't like it when their customers are unhappy with them because they like it when customers are happy and we're dumb enough to give them their money. I'm not saying you should hide your money under a mattress, but the, there is really something dumb about giving them our money so that they can invest it and make money and then charging us bank fees for the privilege to do it. It's ridiculous. Clearly, I have a bee in my bonnet. Uh, but nonetheless, banks want to give their customers back their money because uh, they want customers to be happy so they'll continue to use the banks. So banks do two things, right? They, they, they hold your money. So like I've got a checking account and a savings account at Chase Manhattan. But also, a bank is where you go when you need a loan. You need a car loan. You need a business loan. You need a loan for your house. Whatever, you go to the bank. And so another way banks money make money is they loan you, say, $500,000 for a house, but then they charge you 5% interest. And so they make 5% on the $500,000, and that's a significant amount of money. So banks are like, well, we need to pay back the people whose life savings we lost, so we'll call in the loans. So I want you to imagine this. Imagine one day um, you're just sitting there staring at your phone, um, and, and the, the phone rings, and you pick it up, and you say, hello? And, and it's like, yeah, uh, is this Peg Lamphere? Uh, yes. Oh, this is the bank. Oh, that's not good. Um, you know that... Um, a $350,000 loan we gave you 25 years ago for your house? Yeah. Well, you still owe $150,000 on it. Yeah. Well, we'd like that back. Well, I don't have $150,000.
That's why I took out the loan, right? So what happens is loans, banks call in loans, people can't pay them. So then the next thing, if the bank called in the loan on my house and I couldn't pay it, they can legally take my house or my butcher shop or my shoe shop or my car, all of those things. So the banks start calling in loans and then they start taking properties. But here's the problem for the bank. The properties are only worth something if you can turn around and sell it. And if enough people are taking people's banks and houses, the banks and houses, if enough banks are taking people's houses and businesses and homes, pretty soon there's nobody to buy that stuff because everybody's poor. Let's go see some more. So what happens is, let's say that instead of the bank taking the house, the bank takes my, I have a yarn shop. I have all this great yarn in it. The bank calls in a loan on my yarn shop. I can't pay it. They take my yarn shop. Yarn shop. And that means uh, that um, 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 Jacqueline and, uh, and, and, and Bronwyn, who work in my yarn shop, um, they lose their jobs too. So Jacqueline and Bronwyn and Peg all go home. Now we're unemployed. And so now when we go to the grocery store, we're way more careful with our money. And we quit going to Target. And we quit shopping online. And, and, and we quit buying expensive yarn at other shops, right? So pe people lose businesses. People working at those businesses lose their jobs. Everybody has less money. Everybody spends less money. So let's say all of us that aren't employed now quit spending money at the other yarn shops. So the other yarn shops, even if their loans aren't called in, uh, they, might, they might close too because people are spending less money. Um, and so you get a downward cycle, a kind of flush toilet effect where everybody's circling the drain. Everybody's got less money. There's less money in the economy. It gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. This picture breaks my heart, this family out. And it's the, it's the dog and the little kid in the back that breaks my heart. Um, I don't know why the dog is commensurate with the little kid in my head. It shouldn't be, but it is. Anyway, lots and lots of joblessness and homelessness and un unemployment. And it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse because there's no money in the economy. Does that make sense? I hope it does. It's helpful to understand these things because this stuff happens periodically in world history. And it's handy to understand it if it happens to you. So as that happens, as there's less and less money in the economy and increasing uh, uh, unemployment and thus increasing joblessness and homelessness. Uh, everybody suffers, but some people more than others. You can imagine, this is true in anything, in the Great Recession, in any time. Some populations, people who were already living on the edge, uh, working class people who were just getting by paycheck to paycheck, they're the most vulnerable. In, 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 a, in a white supremacist and sexist country, uh, people of color and women are more vulnerable. Uh, than white people and men. Um, um, some people are always going to suffer more than others. And some people are always going to be okay. So say the rich people lost their investments. They still have plenty of stuff. They have a cushion. It's the regular people that suffer. And the most vulnerable among the regular people who suffer more. No surprise there. Welcome to America. You get increasingly in the Great Depression. The Depression starts in the fall of, of 29, and it takes a while to really ramp up to the worst. That picture on the uh, right uh, of the man turned away, that's called the Angel City Breadline. That's a picture taken by um, um, Dorothea Lang, who you'll learn about in the video assignment. It was until she took the migrant mother picture, which is the picture we started the lecture with, uh, this was her most famous picture. Um, but what you got all over America was these massive, they called them bread lines, but essentially, you know, lines for food banks or soup kitchens uh, that were giving out food because along with joblessness and homelessness comes food insecurity or hunger and became, and what, what I think is interesting about both of those pictures is it's men standing in line. And it wasn't just that men were hungry, but there was sort of a notion in the 1930s that it was shameful for women to appear in these lines. So you sent out a male relative to stand in the line. And, and goddess forbid 
if you didn't have a male relative. I mean, you don't see one woman in that line, and you know they were probably more likely to be unemployed and more likely uh, to be to be poverty stricken than men, and, and and thus just as likely or more likely to be hungry, and yet they're not in the lines. Also, notice there's no people of color in those lines. Um, a lot, not all, but a lot of these uh, bread kitchens, soup kitchens, food bank kinds of, they didn't call them food banks then, uh, served white people and white people only. And black and brown communities had to just take care of themselves, which is a problem if nobody's got anything. Yeah. All right, let's see what's next. And then the conservative response to this is often, well, I don't know what's wrong with these people. Poor people are so lazy. Um, poor people are poor because they're lazy. Uh, um, why are these people all homeless and jobless? Why don't they get work? Well, there is no work because you rich people crash the economy. Um, and the story about why the stock market crashed is a long and complicated story that I did not want to tell. And I still don't want to tell it. But it fundamentally has to do with rich people fiddling around with, with stuff. In the same way with the Great Recession, it's... It started by like financial experts and people who own and run corporations and banks who fiddle around with things, mess things up, and then everybody um, that's not them suffers. And then you can sit around on the 1930s equivalent of Fox TV and complain about poor people and brown people and how lazy they are. But this is not the case in the Great Depression or at any time. Most underemployed or unemployed Americans aren't that way because they're lazy. They're that way because there's institutional problems built into the system. In the Great Depression, there just simply weren't any jobs. Um, and people got depressed enough that they, they gave science to their children. Or I, I had a guy with another picture somewhere here. Maybe I do or maybe I don't with adult men standing around with signs around their necks saying essentially, please hire me. My children are hungry. And you can imagine how desperate you would get before you would do that. But I think people with hungry families will do anything, won't they? Contrary to what rich conservatives will say about that. And as I said, it's much, much worse for people of color, um, for poor people in general and for poor people of color um, in specifics. Uh, I, these pictures, I think both these pictures are really interesting. I think the picture on the left is particularly interesting. Because this family here, while they're a black family, and while they may look on the surface of it to you poor, this is a family that wasn't poor when this started. And you can tell this because, one, they have a car. And in 1930s America, in our America, everybody almost has a car, except the most poor, or people just choose not to. In 1930s, you had to be middle class to have a car. So they have a car. Uh, the girls are wearing, that's a nice dress that girl's wearing. And, it, and she's got a hat, and the other girl's got a hat. Um, so she's got uh, accessories, but see how her dress fits her? That was a nice dress last year or the year before, but she's young. Probably um, her hormones uh, blossomed and her bosoms blossomed, and now the dress is too small for her. So that's a nice dress, but she hasn't had a new dress in a while, and it doesn't fit her anymore. Um, they have the car. Uh, Dad's got a shirt with a collar. Um, these are people who were doing okay, and the Depression came, and slapped them upside of the head, and now they're in trouble. You get something a little like that with the next picture, but not quite the same. This is a, a, a Hispanic family. Um, uh, they've got There's a milk can there. Someone su suspects this is a farm. I don't know about that house. Is that their original house, or is that the place they end up living? It does look a little bit like a shack or a barn. Um, I think these people are further down the rat hole of poverty, either because they started that way because they were Mexican immigrants or because it's later in the Depression than the picture of the family on the left. It's hard to know. But I think these both these pictures, if you stop and look at them, tell desperately sad stories. Let's run the numbers, shall we? So here's the stats for the Great Depression. 25% of employable Americans were out of work by 1932. That's 13 million people. 25%. At the height of the Great Recession, the number were, never went above 10%. And at the height of the pandemic, the number never went above, I think it was 18 or 
So a quarter of employable Americans, Americans who were working before the Depression, were, were not working now. A quarter of America is out of work. That's a lot. You might think, well, it's still a minority. A quarter is a lot. It is, a, it is the highest unemployment numbers ever recorded in American history. But as you can see, the numbers are higher for white women, way higher for black women, and, 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 and somewhere in between for black men, but still. So we, we see numbers uh, closer, 43% for black women, 38% for black men. Um, there are no numbers, and I wish there were, for Asians or, 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 or Hispanic or Chicana people in the Great Depression because the we get these numbers from the U.S. Census. Um, and, and the problem with the U.S. Census is, is until very recently, people get really pissy about all those boxes you have to click in a census. Like, why should it matter what race I am? What is the, why is the government keeping track of that? But for hist historians love those boxes because it tells us all kind of stuff. And if we just, we just count everybody the same, then we can't tell how one group is doing better or worse than the other. And we can't, we can't know stuff about that moment if without those little racial boxes. So I'm a big fan of them because there, in, in the 1930s, there was a census, but you were either black or you were white. Those were the two boxes. And so everybody not black checked white. So all the Hispanics and all the Asians checked the white box, even if the culture in, by no means regard them as white. Um, what they knew is they weren't black. Um, and in a racist country, you didn't ever want to voluntarily check that box. And I'm not trying to be a shitty person. I'm really not. Um, but that, that, that given racism in America, no group was ever going to volunteer to join black Americans in the, the racist group. The group that was being race. Oh, my God. I get so confused by this stuff. Um, the group that was being oppressed by racism. Uh, which is not to say Asians and Hispanic Americans weren't being oppressed by racism, but in a world where there was no box for them to check, they checked the white box. So I don't have numbers for them, but I think if we were smart, and I think we are, despite all of my fumbling around a little bit earlier, um, uh, we can figure out that, that probably for Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans, their numbers are somewhat more like uh, black unemployment than they are like white unemployment, if one had to guess. Okay. And then, oh my God, because a massive nationwide, and it's really worldwide, but this is American history, a massive economic depression that caused 25% to 40% unemployment wasn't bad enough. In the Midwest, the Dust Bowl. Um, years, decades of over farming in the Midwest, small farmers trying desperately to make a living and farming their land uh, and over plowing it and over over uh, planting it and not letting it rest in between created a uh, uh, soil exhaustion and and then there was several years of droughts in the late 1920s and then in the 1930s there's some more droughts and then the wind started to blow and the dust bowl at two words that don't sound that nefarious but if you see those pictures imagine being in that little town as that great big dust cloud comes towards you. It's like something out of a Hollywood movie. You expect Brendan Fraser to jump up and fight mummies with that thing, right? And then look at that, like those, that, there's clearly there's a wagon in that picture on the right and a car. See how much, like those were sitting on the ground and then one of those dust clouds blew in and there you are. Now that's a world where you can no longer live in those towns, those houses, you can no longer farm that soil. Um, Everyone affected by the Dust Bowl is displaced. It's, a, it's an environmental disaster on top of the economic disaster that was the Great Depression. Oh, good. When it rains, it pours. Only here, it's not raining. So here's the notes for the stuff I just said. The Dust Bowl is an environmental uh, disaster caused by bad farming practices. I'm not throwing any shade on farmers. Small farming is hard. It's hard to make a living, uh, but they made a number of mistakes. Um, they overfarmed and they didn't rest their crops. But also, there was a drought and there was wind, and that's not something farmers can do anything about. They didn't do it on porpoise. Porpoise. <laughs> no, there were no porpoises because it was the Midwest. 
They didn't do it on purpose. Uh, they were forced to because this was small farmers are generally essentially working class poor people uh, working hard to support themselves and, and to keep their farms and not lose them to, you know, the banks. So a disaster compounded by the Great Depression. Yeah, We could do a whole lecture on the Dust Bowl, but we're not going to because this is history one and uh, we, we brush up against a lot of things and then we keep moving because we have a lot of territory to cover in 15 weeks. So now we've mentioned it. Now you know it happened. It was sad. It sucked. It's in the middle of the Great Depression. Disaster times disaster. Here's a couple of terms you'll hear sometimes in um, 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 relation to the Dust Bowl. You'll hear about Okies and you'll hear about Exodusters. Okies are white refugees from the Midwest. Um, Okie references Oklahoma, but really if you were anywhere, if you were from Kansas, Nebraska, Indiana, even eastern Montana, and you were what happened with a lot of these small farmers with the combination of the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl is they had to pack up and go west where there was work, and a lot of these people ended up in California. Uh, indeed, Fontana uh, became a town because the the sheriff of Los Angeles County decided he didn't want Okies and Exodusters. Exodusters are black farm refugees. Didn't want Okies and uh, Exodusters coming into Los Angeles County, so he set up a roadblock out on uh, Route 66, which is now Foothill Boulevard. And, 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 and he said, you can't come anymore. You can't go any further. So a lot of these people, these refugees from the Midwest, settled out in Fontana. And many of their grandchildren and great-grandchildren are still there today. And indeed, Fontana's nickname, uh, if you're from the, the great unwashed 909, as am I, uh, we know that Fontana is also called Fontucky. Um, it's, it's, that's pejorative. Uh, but... But but I think that's an interesting story. Here's the thing. It turns out it's illegal. It turns out that in America, you can't put up a roadblock and tell people they can't move from one state or one county to another. But, you know, uh, fear and uh, classism and racism uh, creates all the things. So I have a picture there on the left of a black family uh, fleeing uh, the economic disaster of the Midwest, economic and environmental disaster. And I have on the right a couple of sort of super classic Okie type people. They, like poor lady just looks like a hillbilly. That's probably a perfectly nice lady. I bet when she had groceries, she could make a hell of a pot of, 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 of stew and some really delicious cookies. You just know she could, right? I'm sure the ladies in, in, in the other picture can too, but I don't see them as clearly. Um, the, the picture's not as close up. Anyway, I like the pictures. Okay, here come some maps. All right, from here on out, we're going to be integrating the Lampier family story into the lecture. When we do the Lampier stuff, just listen. Don't write it down. Okay, but here's what I discovered years ago teaching American history in California. Uh, Californians don't know where the states are. So first, um, my family history is Montana, and Montana is a green state up there toward the top. It's in between... Uh, Washington and Idaho on the left, and, nor and the North and South Dakota on the right. See the big state in green? Uh, Montana is the fourth largest state in the Union, behind Alaska, California, and Texas. I think it might be Alaska, Texas, California, then Montana. Um, anyway, there's Montana. Okay, just so you know where it is on a map. And then here's a map of Montana. Um, and there's only a couple of things you need to know about that. We're going to be talking about my grandparents working out at the Fort Peck Dam. So if you see just above the N and the A, that big body of water there, that's uh, that's the Fort Peck Reservoir. It's made by damming the Missouri River. See the Missouri River there? To dam the Missouri River with the Fort Peck Dam create this massive reservoir. It's the fourth largest uh, human-made reservoir in America. You've never heard of it because it's in eastern Montana, and that's okay. Um, and then just if you were wondering, I grew up in Helena, up there with the Red Square, because that's the capital. And I went to college, and my mom went to college, and my brother went to college, and my sister went to college, and my daughter went to college. And my daughter still lives in Bozeman, which is sort of below and slightly to the right of Helena. Um, and that's, it, it, it's not on the map, but that's um, 
Yellowstone Park right south uh, of, of Bozeman. That's all. Yellowstone Park. If you ever want to visit Yellowstone Park, go in May or September because everybody goes there and it's really crappy. Okay, before we get to the Lamphere family story, we need to integrate it into the New Deal. So how we get the New Deal? In 1932, so peak year for the Great Depression, right? The uh, um, a, a stock market crashes in 29. It takes a while for, for, for the banks to figure out how to get the money back, to call in loans, to create the unemployment. By 1932, we have those massive numbers. And there's a presidential election. And the presidential election is between Herbert Hoover, that's the dude on the left, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that's the dude on the right. Um, and and, and um, it's not much of a battle. Hoover lost the election uh, it, it, for resounding reasons. And, and um, oh, my God. So, like, I think a monkey could have run against Hoover and won in 1932 because he was really, really unpopular. But also Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, every time he gave a speech, he said, I have a plan for how we fix this. He didn't just say, trust me, baby, I'm better than the other guy. He had a plan, and he called it, he called his plan a new deal for America. And every time he gave a speech, he'd be like, so then we'll do this, and then we'll do this other thing, and then we'll do this other thing. Only, of course, he was way more specific than I'm being. Yeah? Okay, let's go see more about how Hoover was um, um, a bad president. Oh, and lest you think I'm being mean, he really was. Um, historically, when you take presidential popularity polls, like, you know, favorite and least favorite presidents, it used to be he was always second to the bottom with Richard Nixon at the bottom. Uh, uh, now the polls, uh, they've each, Nixon and Hoover have shifted up one because the um, ex-president, uh, current rapist, orange rapist, is, is now uh, cons consistently at the very bottom of the presidential list, um, except amongst uh, his cult followers. Um, anyway, uh, Hoover was a Republican, no surprise there. He was also a social Darwinist, so he thought one as as a Republican and thus a supporter of the policies of the rich that um, poor people just sucked and we shouldn't help them. But also he was a social Darwinist, which meant he thought that in time when times were tough, uh, the people would just sort themselves out and the weak people would die, and that would be good because they wouldn't reproduce, and the strong people would survive. And that would be good for America. Here's the problem with that theory. That sounds good to some of you, maybe. But you really can't measure people on strength and weakness if they don't have a fair playing field. In a country with sexism and racism and classism, you can't say uh, that the poor are poor because they're weak or they're not as good. They're just unlucky. Um, but anyway, Hoover's position was it would be bad for America to help the poor. So he did nothing. He did nothing. And indeed, those great big homeless settlements, those were called Hoovervilles. Um, and then these people have assigned Hoover's Poor Farm Tobacco Fund. Uh, Hoover, he's hoovering over us. There was, he was immensely unpopular amongst regular Americans. And here's the thing we have, peeps, when you're thinking, I don't know why I should have to vote. There's more of us. Yes, the rich and powerful have a lot of power. But what we have is we have, there's a lot of us. And there were a lot of Americans who were super unhappy that Hoover wasn't doing anything because he was a conservative and a social Darwinist. So FDR runs on this, this plan that he calls a new deal for Americans. It eventually becomes short into just a new deal. Uh, he wins the election handily, and he almost immediately begins implementing um, his his plans. And he's got really two kinds of things. He's got a series of programs to put Americans back to work and solve the immediate problem, and a series of plans for how we keep this from ever happening again. And indeed, if you were wondering why the Great Depression was the last Great Depression, it's because a Democrat in the 1930s got hold of the government, as did a Democratic Congress and a Democratic Senate, because Democrats had the vast majority, um, and put together a series of programs that still exist today that have kept the Great Depression from happening again. Social Security, which is retirement insurance, that is this notion that the federal government would help you pay into a fund, and then when you got old, you could take that money out of the fund and use it for your retirement so you wouldn't be old and poor and homeless. 
that's still in place and it will always be in place. Don't let people tell you it won't be. Um, uh, the Bush presidency and the orange rapist presidency put a fair bit of energy into trying to destroy Social Security with private bank accounts and, and, and they couldn't make it happen and it's a good thing. Um, the FDIC, this isn't a very sexy thing, but it's banking insurance. So the notion is that the federal government underwrites your bank deposits up to a certain amount. I think the amount is 400000 And if you've got more than 400000 in the bank, I don't feel sorry for you. Um, but um, the idea is that if a bank closes, if Chase Manhattan went belly up tomorrow, that my, um, my checking account and savings account, which are well below $400,000 because I do this for a living, they're insured and the federal government will get me that money back. So you don't create that spiral uh, of poverty. Um, and then uh, FDR put together a whole bunch of work pro uh, work programs, the CCC, which was the Civilian Conservation Corps. If you go to national parks, a lot of the roads and campgrounds and, and bathrooms, those they're, they're still there today. Those were built by the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, the public works programs created an immense amount of jobs. They built schools, hospitals, dams. We're going to talk about dams in a second. Um, um, they funded public art. The um, post office in Pomona down on Holt and the post office in Claremont uh, near Old Town Claremont, in Old Town Claremont, both have WPA murals in them. So the notion was that we would, the federal government paid artists to paint things in public buildings. Why not? And then a whole bunch of uh, programs for farms, um, and, and for rural people as well. And we're going to take a look at those in the coming slides. So probably the very biggest jobs program, the, the, the biggest let's prevent this from ever happening again is the Social Security and um, FDIC, the banking insurance. And then the biggest job program is let's put people back to work and solve the immediate problem. As I said, was the Works Progress Administration. Nobody ever says Works Progress Administration. They say WPA. Yeah. Well, like I said in oops, oh, um, as I said in the previous slide, they they built schools, libraries, bridges, roads, national parks, hospitals, and dams. Lots of public art. The WPA put 8.5 million people to work. 8.5 million people to work, and, and both of those. Uh, um, um, pieces of art down there at the bottom of the slide are WPA public art. So they exist in some public building somewhere. I think the painting on the right is in the Redlands Courthouse. I could be wrong. I know there's a mural in there. I haven't been out there lately. I don't remember. Yeah. Okay, so I jokingly call this Big Damn History. It is the history of big dams, but Big Damn History makes me laugh. I'm a four-year-old. I, I regret it. The most famous dam built by uh, the WPA is the Hoover Dam over there in Nevada. The water back up behind it creates Lake Mead. The Hoover Dam was built, as you see there in the slide, from 31 to 35 and employed 5,000 men at a time for a total of 21,000 jobs. And here's the thing, what Hoover would have done is you'd have had 21,000 people, men almost entirely, working on the dam. But then those men would have needed to, be, needed to be fed, housed, barbered, occasionally sexed up. Um, and so you'd have all of the, the additional uh, workers that would go with the dam workers. You'd have uh, a little like shanty towns of, of restaurants and, and, and movie theater. Not Probably not movie. Well, in the 30s you'd have had maybe a movie theater, but maybe a dance hall, um, a grocery store. And there's more jobs, right? So it's not just the 21,000 dam workers. It's all the rest. And then once the dam is job done, it creates more jobs. It creates hydroelectric jobs because the Hoover Dam then creates the electricity that makes Vegas. In 1931, Vegas is got 14 people in it. Um, and then you get electricity to Vegas and you light it up. And somebody says, we could air condition it. And then there you go. Bob's your uncle. Vegas is huge. Um, it also creates an immense amount of water, which um, then creates jobs to get the water to the place that needs the water the most, two places really, Vegas and Los Angeles. Um, and Los Angeles in the 1930s is not that big a place, or Southern California isn't. 
Southern California gets big because it suddenly has access to a whole bunch of fresh water. Because it is one of our problems down here in SoCal. Too many people, lots of ocean, not enough fresh water. Yeah? So, the Hoover Dam. Out in Montana, much less famous, uh, and, and, and not as uh, visually impactful as the, as the Hoover Dam. If you go back and look at that Hoover Dam picture, it's built in a gorge, so it, great, it creates this massive, great, big, really tall, visually impressive uh, dam. Uh, Fort Peck is in East Montana. East Montana is the Great Plains. It is flat. Fort Peck Dam is long and low. It is not nearly as visually impressive as, as the Hoover Dam, but it creates a lake that's significantly bigger than, uh, than, than Lake Mead. And, and, and Lake Mead's pretty big, um, even during when the drought. If you, if you haven't seen pictures of what happened to Lake Mead when it didn't rain here for a while, you should go look at those. Um, it's kind of astounding. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Fort Peck Dam is built in East Montana, uh, and it's the same thing. It creates a bunch of jobs, uh, it creates hydroelectric, and it creates water. And in East Montana, the water is, now you can water, you can have farms that have, you can irrigate so you can grow more stuff. So this dam, like the Hoover Dam, creates a lot of jobs. I think I have statistics on the next slide. All right, see, I do. Look at that. Yay, me! Ah. Anyway, uh, the Fort Peck, while it's the biggest dam in Montana and in, in, the, in the High Plains, it is one of six dams damming the Missouri River in 1933 to 36. The WPA built uh, another, they built two dams over by Helena, Holter, and Hauser, and then, and then there's some more dams, and I don't remember all their names, and it doesn't matter, you don't care. Um, Holter and Hauser I know because they were near Helena where I grew up, and they created lakes that my family used to boat on, so you know, times were tough. Back to uh, uh, Fort Peck though, Fort Peck uh, employed 10,500 workers, including my dad's dad, my grandpa, uh, Francis Lamphere. And then to, to, to feed and house uh, and entertain 10,500 workers, there were 10,000 auxiliary dam workers. So again, it says teachers, grocers, barbers, cooks. Uh, also, and my dad says, don't tell students this, but I always do. Apparently his Aunt Ruby worked in the dance hall um, and, and as a, you know, a lady who danced with men for money. And I think we can put air quotes around danced. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, you know, dudes dudes need an orgasm, too. Anyway, so my grandpa, Lamp Grandpa Fran, I'll tell you the story in the next slide. But Fran worked on the dam, and Clara worked uh, as a cook in, in one of the restaurants near the dam. I just have this picture here for while I talk. And again, you're not going to write any of this stuff down. You're just going to listen. And I do have a point I'm going to have you write down, so just be patient with me, okay? This is a picture of downtown Fort Peck, a town that didn't exist until somebody decided the WPA uh, and FDR and the Democratic president and the Democratic Congress decided uh, to, 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 to create a jobs program, right? Um, uh, Fran was the – he's the my, – my grandpa – who I barely knew because he died when I was very little, um, he was the fifth son of a farmer back in Illinois. And, and his two oldest brothers were twins, so he wasn't going to inherit anything. So when he graduated from high school, he literally jumped the trains, you know, like a hobo, and he would ride around the Midwest and looking for farm work. So he's a farm laborer, a poor guy. I don't own anything. I have a suitcase, and I hire out to farms, and I buck bales or I help plant things. I do whatever farmers need. And he got to Glasgow, Montana. Out, It's a town nearest Fort Peck. Only Fort Peck didn't exist yet. Um, and, and, and he was bucking bales in, in, in the midsummer, and he met Clara Dernberger. And, and apparently they fell in love. And then uh, they, they did what people do when they fall in love. Um, they, they, and they made the sweet, sweet love, and, and Clara got pregnant and they had to get married. Uh, and this was this was a problem for Clara because Clara had a full full right scholarship to the University of Montana. She was supposed to go to University of Montana and get a degree to be a teacher, but instead she got pregnant and married. And in those days, 
uh, 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 married ladies didn't get to go to college. So there they are. They're uh, young. Uh, he's poor. He's got no job. He's got a young wife. Eventually he has a baby, my dad's oldest brother, Dick. Um, and then the Great Depression starts. They, they got married and in the summer of 29. The stock market collapsed in 20, the fall of 29, and the economy went to hell, and there's Clara and Francis. And, and they're sitting there in East Montana. They're living with his parents, her parents' house, and times are tough. Okay, so as I said, and again, you're not writing this stuff down. So their first baby is born just about when the stock market crashes. Dick was born just a couple of weeks before that, about mid-October, if I remember correctly. Doesn't matter. Um, they had no jobs. They live with Claire's parents, and they don't have any more babies. And we know she's fertile because she got pregnant, but she wasn't married, right? They don't have any more babies. So I don't know what they're doing. I didn't have the sort of relationship with Clara where I could ask her about her reproduction, um, but but they don't have babies. And then the Fort Peck Dam comes to, to East Montana in 1933, and they both go out there in 1934, and it's like 30 miles from Glasgow, and they both get jobs at the Fort Peck Dam. He's just a common laborer. He's literally a guy with a shovel and a wheelbarrow, and she's a cook. Um, and they get jobs, and then there's housing out there for the people that have jobs. So now they each have a paying job and they have a place to live that isn't her parents house and they have another baby they have my dad Paul in 1935 he is a damn baby he is a direct result of they got jobs at the dam and they could afford to have another kid he's six years younger than Dick so there's six years between their first baby um, joblessness 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 then a job then their second baby okay Again, you didn't write any of that down. Then what happens? And again, you're still not writing this down. Uh, in 1936, the dam job is done. And, but in the meantime, the RSA, the Resettlement Agency, um, and, and then another, uh, 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 the Resettlement Agency, what they've done is they've taken all the farms that banks took away in 29, 30, 31. The federal government has taken, and then the farms, the banks couldn't sell them. The banks went under and now the farms are just abandoned. The federal government uh, picks them up under, fed, under public domain, and they put together these little package farms. Each farm is 350 acres. They've all got the exact same two-bedroom, one-bath house. They've all got a barn. They've all got a garage. They've all got a chicken coop, all of them. They're the same. And then they sell these farms to, 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 to people who want to buy them. They sell them very inexpec in, inexpensively. And they offer, in another federal program, AAA, the Agricultural Administration Act, offers no interest loans. So you can buy a farm, you can buy a federally government-sponsored farm with a federally government-sponsored no interest loan. And so poorish people can afford to buy a farm. And Dick and Clara get themselves a farm in, on a piece of land between Glasgow and Fort Peck, and we'll see what happens next. So first, back to the RSA, because the federal government didn't do this to help Fran and Clara. They did it to help people in general. The idea was they recognized that while there were a lot of poor people in towns, most Americans, until 1980, most Americans lived in the country. They didn't live in towns. And so the idea is, how do we put poor people in rural America back to work? Well, we get them farms. And so they create this propaganda campaign. Propaganda sounds bad. It just means a campaign designed to get people to buy, to put air quotes around buy, but to buy an idea. And the idea was that you could trust the federal government to get you an affordable farm with a no-cost loan. Um, so so the federal they put a fair bit of time of effort into this notion that we're going to recognize that, that a bunch of you lost your farms or that your farms are no good anymore and that we're putting together some nice little farm packages. They're going to be fantastic and we want to offer you this opportunity. Which is very cool. Very, very cool. The other cool thing about it is the RSA, the Resettlement Administration, it was nationwide so they weren't just doing it in East Montana or Kansas and Nebraska. They did it all over the American South too and a lot of poor farmers in the American South 
were black, and the RSA didn't discriminate. And when I say that, I'm always surprised when I say that. Because a lot of times the federal government will help poor white people, but not help poor black or brown people. So, and they not only didn't discriminate, they understood that, that both black and Hispanic Americans would be deeply suspicious of the federal government, and for good reason, and that they wouldn't believe that these farms were for them, so they wouldn't apply for them. So they put a fair bit of money into sell to 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 campaigns that to convince black and brown Americans that that they too uh, were were could could put their toe in the waters of these resettlement farms and these low interest loans, and that they could they could they could move from either having no farm to having a farm or from having a bad and broken down farm to a better farm. So that's pretty cool. And then, like I said, all of this farm stuff uh, from the Resettlement Administration, the RSA, was underwritten by AAA loans, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. I think I said Agricultural Administration Act earlier, but it's Agricultural Adjustment Act, which, which, was, which not only offered low or no interest loans, but also offered people help with crop planning, like what should you plant in this place and when should you plant it and how should you rotate your crops, stuff that people like me who grew up in Montana just know. Um, and then crop prices, how do we keep our, how do you sell your crops for enough to make money at it, but not so much that people can't afford to buy food. Um, and, and, and this picture here, this is an AAA office and they're signing people up for loans and you'll see, and it looks like the two white guys got to go first. But there's four black guys standing in the background, and one assumes, however much they shouldn't have to wait their turn, they're at least in the office, and somebody's going to sign them up for AAA help. So that's interesting, and it's suggestive that the government uh, it was capable, even in the 1930s, of, of helping everybody, not just the white people. Or at least helping more people than just the white people. I don't think they helped everybody because you can never do that. Yeah. So what about Fran and Clara? Let's go back there again. You're not going to write any of this down, but I like this because I can make this specific. That not only do I know intellectually as an historian that these programs help people, I literally in my family have proof that these programs help people. That I would not exist if it weren't for these programs. I'll get to that argument in a minute. So in 1936, they get an RSA farm with an AAA loan, and they farm sugar beets on it because the AAA agent, the Agricultural Administration agent, says right now there's a great market for sugar beets. Plus, sugar beets um, require a fair bit of labor picking, but you can put a whole bunch of, of, of – there are Mexicans who come across – they're Mexicans. They're not immigrants. They're not Mexican-Americans. They're Mexicans. But they would come across the border at harvest seasons and travel – through uh, the American West, picking crops, and then go back to Mexico and live out the winter, get away from the American win American West winter, which is god awful, um, and then be back traveling in the spring and summer again. But so what you could do is you could put Mexicans to work uh, uh, planting beets and create those jobs for itinerant workers, and, and you could also there's a market for sugar. Um, so they get this farm. And what do they do? They get pregnant. And in 1937, my Uncle Mike was born. And then two years later, my Uncle Pat was born. And then two years after that, my Aunt Kathy was born. And then not long after that, my Uncle Tim was born. He's the coolest. You guys would love him. Um, he always has the, the best liquor and the best barbecue at the family reunions. Anyway, um, um, so here's what, you, here's what I want to say about that. One... These people had a baby in 1929, then they didn't have a baby until my dad in 1935. So that's six years with no babies. So it suggests that because there was no job and they didn't have their own place, uh, they were doing something to limit their fertility. If they hadn't had help from the federal government, they probably wouldn't have had any of these kids because they managed to not have kids for six years. So they, whatever they were doing, it worked. Um, so my dad is born because the government helps with the damn job. And then all of my uncles and my one aunt are born because the government help with the farm. Um, those people, Paul, 
Mike, Pat, Kathy, Tim. There are, those people are born as a direct result of the federal government helping Fran and Clara so they can afford to have a family. Pretty cool. Oh, here's all the stuff I just said. Um, but um, and again, don't write it down. But but there it is. These people, um, they're born as a di direct result uh, of the New Deal. My dad from the dam, the rest of them from the farm. And then and then there's more. So here's the thing that happens. Uh, Paul, who's who's born because of the dam job, he marries Jackie and he has four kids, one of whom the oldest and and the best looking and smartest is me. Uh, Mike and Carol. Mike is a Mike, Pat, Kathy, and Tim are all the farm babies, right? Mike marries Carol, has four kids. Pat marries Lady Di, has four kids. Uh, uh, my Aunt Kathy marries John and has three kids. Uh, my Uncle Tim marries Jody. They have two kids. Um, so that's 17 people born of New Deal babies. So 17 people plus the original five, which is really 21, who wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for government help. But wait, there's more. Isn't this the way with families? You probably have family stories like this. And some of you have way more people and way more kids. But this is plenty. This is enough. Um, all of those people, me, my brothers, my cousins, they have babies so that there are 20. Fran and Clara have 22 great grandchildren. They have, yeah, because we're the grandchildren. I'm the grandchildren generation. So they have 22 great grandchildren. There's the 17 grandchildren. And there's the five children. That's 44 people. 44 people born of the New Deal. And here's the thing. You might think, well, that's 44 people the world didn't need. I mean, you know, there's too many of us already, especially if you live in California. But it's 44 people. There's not a felon among them. Well, my brother had his trouble with the law, but he straightened up. Um, um, and there's a couple of people who had addiction problems, but they straightened up. But 44 people who were nurses, doctors, teachers, professors, police officers, uh, soldiers, sailors, Pilots. My brother Steve's a pilot. He's a terrible person, but he's a pilot. Um, that is, 44 people who, who 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 endeavor to make the world a better place. Except maybe my brother Steve. He really is a terrible person. He says the meanest things. Anyway, so 43 people that endeavor to make the world a better place. People who pay their taxes. People who help people. All because of the New Deal. So I think when people, it irks me when people are being cynical about the government. The government's full of crooks that it doesn't do anything to send impede us. It does help us. Um, my education, I'm, I'm entirely a product of public education. I went to public schools, K through 12. I went to a publicly funded college. I went to a publicly funded college for my master's, a publicly funded college for my PhD, which means that my tuition was less than it would have been at a private school because the government was underwriting it. Um, so one, my education, and I have a very fine education, um, is about the government helping. And there's so many other things, right? But here what we have is we have these programs and the, and the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, just this calamitous times, and, and, and the nation has the sense to elect somebody who says, I'm going to help you. Um, so something very different from what happened during the pandemic when our president wasn't helping us at all. Um, when the government says, we're going to help you, the government can help. Does it help everybody? No. Does it help everybody equally? No. Notice all of these 44 people are white. And I don't mean kind of white. I mean like super white, like Montana white, like our ancestors were German and Irish white. Um, and, and, and that's not an accident. But, but we do know that some of these programs help people who weren't white. I don't want to get too celebratory about this, but I also don't want to be a cynic. Government matters, and it matters None of this would have happened. These 44 people, they aren't alive if in 1932 Hoover, Herbert Hoover had been re-elected because the voters said, oh, it doesn't matter if I vote. The people are all crooks. I don't care. If the people in 1932 had done what the people did in 2016, we'd have gotten Hoover again, and I wouldn't be alive to give you this lecture. I don't think that's an overstatement. I think, I think, Government matters, and people exerting their will on the government matters. And I think we, we can make this massive difference. It's just I think you're told really aggressively that you can't make a difference because the people in power want you to think you can't. They want you to stay home. Think about that. 
So my point with the whole Lampier thing, and this is where I think, you know, this is what matters. It wasn't, I didn't need you to memorize when Fran and Clara got married or how many kids they had. I don't, don't want you to do any of that. But what I was trying to do is tell you a point so I couldn't just say this stuff like some airy-fairy hippie liberal and you'd be like, yeah, but Peg, you've got, you're just a big weirdo. But rather, I illustrate a very real point that the government can do good, that it should do good, that it sh the government should exist to help people. But it can't if you don't vote for the people that are willing to help. Um, that government should protect students, citizens, but it won't if you don't elect the people that think they should protect all the citizens, not just the white conservative Protestant ones. The government does make a difference in all parts of our lives. It is not the most important part of our lives. A lot of the stuff that we do has nothing to do with government. I'm going to finish this and go down and screw around in my backyard and play with dirt. It has nothing to do with government. But everything I'm doing now, I'm a teacher in California. My job is paid for by the state of California. You are going to college at a very affordable community college because California is underwriting that for you. That's a good deal. And here's the thing, if you all voted, maybe community college would go back to being free because you could demand it. But you don't all vote. So they don't care. Right? But we know that the government matters because the New Deal is proof. And because the Lampier family story is proof. And again, for you brown and black students, you might think it's super easy for you to have faith, Peg, with all your whiteness. And you're not wrong. Oh, no, you're not wrong. I, I'm privileged in my whiteness, but if we all show up and vote, and I mean all of us, not just the white people, we can make government more responsive to all of us, too. We don't get anything done whining. You don't get anything done uh, being salty about it. You don't get anything done about bitching about it on, on Insta or, or, or X or, or TikTok. You only get things done by getting involved, by voting. Voting is the bare minimum. I vote and I teach. But you only make a difference in America if you put your phone down, quit whining about your problems, and get to work. That's what you do. And it doesn't mean you all have to join you know, voter registration drives, but you have to speak up. You have to show up at the polls. You have to pay attention to what's going on just a little bit, not a ton. I don't watch the news. I don't, I don't, there's a lot of stuff I don't want to know. But I also watch enough to know what's going on. And I'm 62 years old and I know exactly what my values are. I show up the occasional march when I need to. I've never missed an election in my whole life. And I do this for a living. So I get to, I get to lecture you. That's literally my job. Anyway. Quit being cynical. It's a cop out. It's an excuse for laziness. That's my story. Let's go look at the last slide and get you out of here. All right, so endeth our lecture. Here's another thing. If you think government doesn't matter, I'm just going to say these two words, Social Security. You pay into it, and you will get it back. And for all the cynicism about there about you'll never see a dime of that, that's not true. You will. And here's why. Because nobody in government wants to be at the head of government when Social Security collapses. So they will always make sure that it still exists. Just don't let the rich conserv the, the conservatives who, who, who represent the interests of the rich talk you into changing Social Security into something else. It's worked for almost 100 years. It could work for another more. And there ain't nothing like that. When I retire next year, and I got one more year of this, um, I'll have my pension from Cal Poly, and I'll have my pension from Mount Sac, which isn't very big because I work part-time here at Mount Sac. But I'll also have my Social Security, and it'll be enough. I won't be rich. Probably won't go to Italy. But I'll get to go to the grocery store. I'll get to go fishing. I'll go skiing. And I will love my kids and my grandkids. And someday so will you. I don't know how I got there. Feeling, feeling philosophical this morning. So endeth our lecture. Uh, we're getting close to the end. This was the Great Depression we've got left. We've got World War II um, and then some, and then the social justice thing. And then we have a week where you're going to pick a movie and watch a movie. So we have, after this, three more weeks and then the final. 
which is still a lot. That sounds like a month's worth of work, as it is, but we're so much closer to the end than we were. And I know you're getting tired. We get tired in fall semester. We get tired, I think, tired-er in spring semester. But we get tired, and we're ready to be done. You're close. So don't don't bail out. Don't disappear. I want you to succeed because you have life goals, and I want you to meet them so that maybe someday uh, you are fishing and loving your grandchildren just like me. Yeah? Okay. See ya. I already miss you.